Hello, everyone. Happy Sunday and welcome to Scottish Watches and our show Call the AD. Uh, I'm Arthur. I'm Tick Tick Broom on Instagram. And I'm Stephanie. I'm She Watches the World on Instagram. And this is our weekly show where we go deeper on one topic live with here you, with you all here on YouTube uh, and try to have some fun with it. This week, we're going to be talking about um, the the right the watches for Mars. I'm super excited about this topic. So obviously, I'm a huge space geek. Space, you know, is is my life both professionally, but personally, I'm a big fan. Um, I'm wearing my Occupy Mars um, shirt today, kind of a remnant of the Occupy Wall Street move, movement, but a fun um, fun spin on it. Um, anyway, we thought it would be really fun to talk about watches that you would want um, if you were going to go on an expedition on Mars in celebration of the Perseverance landing that just happened this week, which was incredible and crazy. And, um, you know, I know some people who have been working on that program for, you know, a decade, if not 15 years at this point. So to see this major success and the pictures that come back from it are really amazing. And there's been a lot of talk about watches in space and we'll, we'll certainly do a little bit of that, but I thought it'd be fun to be a little bit more forward leaning and forward thinking right. and looking at, you know, you know, I don't want to wear an Apple Watch. <laughs> what, what would you actually want to wear? What complications would you want? And then take a look at some of um, the the watches that have already been designed or thought about for right. for Mars. Because some brands are starting to think about it and have actually made some very interesting watches. Yeah. So before we get into it, uh, please like the video, subscribe, and hit the bell icon so that you know when we go live in the future. And you can follow us on Instagram at callva.d to keep up to date on what we're up to. Um, but so there's an, we'd like to introduce a guest this week. Um, and and the, the connection here is really, I think there are, when you think about brands that have started to be more forward looking on space, um, it's really more the creativity of independent brands uh, where, where that shines through. So we have a friend of Scottish Watches, uh, Pietro from the limited edition, uh, who's gonna be here with us today uh, to talk about particularly the, the innovation of some of the independent brands that are looking forward with space. So uh, I'm gonna bring on Pietro here. Good morning or good Hello, afternoon. Hi, Pietro. Yes, here I am. Nice to see you. Nice to see you, Arthur and Stephanie. Uh, and thanks for having me. Sure, thanks for joining us. Uh, do you wanna just, uh, you know, we've certainly heard you on Scottish Watches before and your other media channels, but do you wanna take a moment to introduce yourself and, and what, what the limited edition is and what you're into? Yeah, I can't help. Uh, I can't help n not being with uh, Ricky and the boys at Scottish Watches every now and then because they have so much fun uh, <laughs> talking with them, you know, about watches and the the funny things in life. Because I think that the spin they put on uh, and and you guys all put on uh, watchmaking is is great. Watchmaking is much more than just an art of making watches, but it is a big metaphor uh, in so right. many aspects of life. So. Yeah, uh, we are the limited edition. Um, we are a platform fully dedicated to the world of independent watchmaking that was underground and obscure until uh, a few years ago. And now it's taking the, the role of protagonist for so many collectors around the world. So in 2015, I basically saw that uh, compared to the main street, uh, you know, ma mainstream brands that you can find in your local AD pretty much all over the world, there was an underground world of incredible artists that didn't get the recognition and the visibility that they deserved, in my humble opinion. So we started as a, you know, as a, as a trial, as a, uh, you know, a small entrepreneur. We started to put them all together under the same roof, and we discovered that there are thousands of watch lovers around the world that are both fascinated and uh, interested in uh, in these uh, yeah, in these niche uh, watchmakers. Yeah, it's fantastic. I, I think it's great. This is a world that I don't know much about and I'm trying to learn more and more because frankly, it's really interesting and it's exciting and it's not seeing the same things over and over again. So, um, you know, thank you for bringing attention to these brands and so we can learn some more about them. They are just really fascinating right. and interesting and different. Yeah. And, and the, the collection of brands you've managed to put together in one place is really cool. And and for for me, who's still learning sort of the space of the creativity of independent brands, even just browsing the site has been uh, educational yeah. and really cool. No, it's, it is interesting because like in any business, you know, um, mainstream brands, they glorify, they enhance the research and the development 
um, of you know small engineers or small uh, how can I say smaller uh, artists that don't that don't have a platform to re to really reach the world. So independent watchmaking has always existed as a platform. You know, if you think about the Omega uh, coaxial story, obviously uh, the coaxial escapement having been developed by George Daniels back in the days, that's a perfect example. So what we are only doing, um, you know, in a, with our modest endeavor is to really give more light and more credit to those that are behind these incredible, incredible stories. Yeah, that's fantastic. It's very Great. cool. Very cool. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, um, and this should be a fun topic. Yeah. Um, um, and, you know, looking forward to kind of your your take on a few of the independent Mars pieces that we've found. Yeah. Um, so a maybe daunting, daunting topic as well, because it hasn't been written yet. It's, a, it's a, blank, a blank canvas, isn't it? Which which is great, and, may, and maybe actually before we get into some of the things that I've um, you know thought about specifically for Mars, there's obviously a long storied history of watches in space, and a lot of disagreement about first watches in space. You know, everybody talks about the Speedmaster, of course, and we don't have to delve into the full history of of watches in space. I think that's been a topic that's well worn. Um, but you have an interesting story, right? Of, of what um, yeah, the yeah. anecdote well, of like the, the real first watch in space. Listen, because we are here and we are free to say what we what we want, we're going <laughs> to add a bit of confusion on the already confused. Great. <laughs> genius. Let's add fuel to the fire. Yeah. Let's do yeah, it. Because obviously there is first watch in space. There is a first uh, self-winding watch in space. There is a first automatic watch in space. There is the first Swiss watch watch in space uh, there is the first um uh yeah the the the, the, the tribute to the first endeavors that uh, came out recently by uh, uh, by tagoy but yeah there is a story that is totally underground and i'm only lucky to have discovered about this because we have one of the things we specialize on is russian watchmaking and everybody knows that under the radars the the Russians are always developing things before anyone else, and 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 things happen very much that way in the 60s when the space race started, and in 61 months before uh, Gagarin actually went for the first time to space with his uh, with his watch that you know uh, it's still um, debatable which watch exactly Gagarin was was wearing, but it was definitely a Russian watch because at the time. Russian was a fully autarkic society. Uh, before that, the Russians did some tests with dogs that they were sending in space. And there is a proven and, uh, and, and certified expedition that was um, uh, the name of the expedition. I, I, I haven't been told, but it was a Vostok spacecraft that was sent in, uh, in space with a dog that was called Chernushka. And this dog Chernushka was equipped on his jacket uh, with uh, with a mechanical timepiece that one of the engineers sneakily uh, attached <laughs> to his jacket. And as I will go to the brand that is actually now, um, uh, how can I say, can, can certify this story, is the brand Raketa. Raketa is, a, is an historical uh, Russian watchmaker. In those days, the brand was called Pobeda, and Pobeda was the name of those uh, of, a, of a brand basically created by Stalin right after the war to celebrate the victory against fascism. So mm -hmm. Pobeda wow. became the, the most important watch brand from 45 to 61. And in 61, one of those watches went to space with this poor dog that was sent <laughs> on his own, uh, but made it back. The, the dog and the watch made it back. And because the engineer didn't, everything was fully recorded and, uh, as you may imagine, um, classified. So it should not happen that an engineer decides uh, decides out of his own uh, uh, out of his own mind to 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 you know to send a mechanical watch with the dog. But he did it anyway, and because <laughs> of that, the KGB made an investigation afterwards, and the engineer was nearly sent to the gulag. Okay. Uh, so, oh man! Yeah, I was I was promised by our friends at Raketa that they can fully prove and certify this. So I promise huh. to send you and uh, you know prove of what I'm saying here. Yeah, wow. I love that. It's just such a great story. And first off, Leica gets all the like, you know, media press as being the first space dog, dog, the space dog. Yeah. But to have the story with another another dog, that's really fun. I, I just I hadn't heard that one before. So. This was 61. So this was okay. eight years before the Apollo 11 mm -hmm. mission. 
and it was a few months before Gagarin actually officially went before to Before he flew. Right. Yeah. Do they, does Raketa know what model it was or what it looked like or anything like that? Uh, it was, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't know about that. I, they barely know that it was a Poveda. Okay. <laughs> right. and it wasn't a Raketa because ah, Raketa right. is, Raketa has 300 of his, uh, 300 v- years of history from 1721. Imagine that. But they've changed name uh, a lot of times depending on the, you know, the, uh, the, the, the drama and the flips <laughs> of Russian history in the meantime. Right. So, I see. Raketa, more than a watch brand, is a witness of, you know, of the evolution of Russian history, which is really fascinating. Huh. Oh, that is. That's very fun. cool. That's a great story. And I hadn't heard that one before. I love it. Yeah. yeah. And it's the watch that Ricky wears as well, a Raketa watch. So really? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. yeah. <laughs> Does he have the big zero? Is that the one he has? No, or, he has or is it the, the Copernic? Copernic, yeah. Yeah. Right. Okay. He has the original Soviet Union ver- Soviet Union version and the contemporary one that has been relaunched recently. Oh, very cool. Okay. Those are really neat. Yeah. Yeah. So you prepared some thoughts. I did. Moving on to the Mars focus. Exactly. Um, Yeah. I thought it would be fun. Just, um, you know, one of the things that frustrates me about some of the the major brands, and I'll I'll just say like Omega in particular, is that there's always this focus on the past of commemorating historical events in space, which is great. And and, um, those, those are important things to celebrate. I would certainly like to see celebrations of more current achievements in space um but you know there's there's a historic look but for this conversation let's look let's look forward so um this is a picture one of the first picture that perseverance took out the window which i think is um not even out the window just it doesn't need a window yeah. <laughs> the first picture that With perseverance took which is, is really amazing and um incredible to see and i i hope it's getting everybody excited about what's ahead um toward you know the steps that we're going to take towards eventually getting getting humans on mars which i think is actually very feasible in the not too distant future so yeah um so being an engineer you put together a powerpoint yeah arthur and i are both engineers we couldn't help ourselves um and go to go ahead and go to the next slide sure. um this is just to, like geek out a little bit about how into space into space we are um i somehow have myself dressed up with two pictures next to two different um, landers the one where i'm in the white shirt that's that's phoenix um and the one on the left i don't know i'm wearing my tiffany watch, <laughs> yeah. watch in that uh-huh. picture um but that was a couple of years ago it's um, yeah because one thing we won't lose if we go to Mars is style. So we, exactly, we have to be you know, style anyway. Yeah, you yeah. know, it looks like you're on the surface there. Well, and if I was going to Mars, yeah. I would naturally wear a red ball gown and red yeah, lipstick and right. a Tiffany's dress watch. So sure. that's that's perfect. <laughs> yeah. um, and then just some funny pictures. Uh, every year there's a big celebration. Uh, we call it Yuri's Day, but April 12th to celebrate um, Yuri Gagarin's first flight. And in DC, but also all around the world, there are um, Yuri's night parties, and they go all night. They're really fun. Mm. They're big dance parties. And um, that was from a, one a few years ago. I yeah. made you dress up, but I didn't make right, you see it. Right. I didn't like subject you to, to <laughs> having those those pictures up. Um, and then I got to go to a really interesting um, premiere for the National Geographic um, Mars special that they did, which is a fun series that's a mix of um, like a docu series, but there's like a drama mixed mm-hmm. in with a documentary. Anyway, you, anyway, you guys should check it out if you haven't seen it. Do, do, um, do you think we will reach very soon uh, cinematographic uh, creativity like in the 70s, you know, Star Trek, Star Trek and all the likes? Is that going to come back as well? I think so. I mean, one of our I favorite hope. shows right now is The Expanse, um, and that has um, uh, a whole you know, one of the three major, I guess, societies or groups that are fighting mm-hmm. are the Martians. Um, and it's kind of fun to yeah. see their, their team. Humans that humans have moved that have to moved Mars, Mars at and, that point, you know, yeah. decades and ago. And how they've evolved. Um, anyway, I, I think it's a great show. Jeff Bezos is like personally keeping it going because he wants to, <laughs> yeah. to see how it goes. But they've done some really good, like scientific thinking about if people had lived on Mars for a few generations, what, yeah. um, how would they evolve? Yeah, because uh, technically uh, there is a bad news on the on the exploration of Mars is that technically there are no Martians there yet. Yeah. <laughs> we are the most likely to become Martians. In future, I think right? so. Yeah, we're, we're going to be the first. That's true. It's yeah. a good point. 
That's a good point. Um, and then the last picture here, which I think is really cool, is we went to this um, amazing event at the Air and Space Museum here in DC. And Arthur and I had the chance to meet, you know, a, a absolute legend and Scott Carpenter. Um, and he was lovely and just could not have been um, more of a gentleman, he was he was wonderful to talk to and hear yeah. some of the stories that he had. So uh, did you talk about about bridling or was he? <laughs> we we didn't actually turn the topic towards watches, no. but he was not wearing he was not wearing an avatar or cosmo. Oh, okay, <laughs> sorry Dan, I know Dan's on here, but yeah. yeah. Yeah, but he's basically the guy responsible for Navitai or for Brightling making the cosmos. Exactly. Right? Yeah. Oh yeah. Anyway, so all of this to say, Arthur and I are big space geeks, um, particularly me. You've caught on, yeah. um, and that's that's part of why we're so excited about this. Um, you know, but yes, yeah. yeah. On a, no, sorry to interrupt, but on no. a side note, on a side note, without this incredible leap forward that has been made recently in uh, in space exploration, because I grew up in the eighties when the whole thing you know went down a little bit and uh, and now to see this uh, renaissance of the in interest and the and the and the you know the funds uh, mm -hmm. invested into into something that becomes more and more realistic uh, the limited edition would have never existed because uh, you know reading about what Elon Elon Musk was doing in the you know from 2000 to 2010 and uh, and reading also about what Jeff Bezos you know uh, is, uh, was was achieving at the same time gave gave me really all the time the idea that if they're managing to to accomplish what they are accomplishing surely you know a small business promoting independent watch brands could have been viable <laughs> yeah and it could have not been too scary oh no, that's that's great yeah, that's i point. i am just so um um thrilled that there's such an interest in space and you know one of the fun things that I do on the side of my uh, um, you know on the side of my professional career is talk to students who are trying to start careers and in, in the space industry and just to see so much excitement and the fact that they're clamoring for jobs for working for some of these startup space companies is is really wonderful and you mentioned the financial investment there really is a space I hope it's not a bubble but a real boom in space investment right now right. Um, every week there seems to be some new announcement of a space company going public so so um, just the infusion of cash that's happening right now, I hope that's all a very positive thing and we're going to see a lot of, yeah. um, a lot of new development. Also, Bitcoin, so. Bitcoin fingers crossed, <laughs> everything <laughs> goes well, we'll bring some extra funds, I think, to the exactly. To the SpaceX. Yeah. Exactly. That's right, that's right. Yeah. And then all the successful space folks are going to want really interesting watches. I hope so. There we go. Yeah, let's like raise the <laughs> price of those stocks so I can, I can get some new watches. Um, anyway, so this was my, go ahead and go down, my yeah. Friday night thoughts um, of what I thought would be some interesting complications to have. So first off, just kind of as, as a baseline for those who are not as geeked out about, about Mars as we are, um, Mars has a longer day. It's 24 hours and 39 minutes plus some seconds. I'm sure someone in the chat will correct me. Um, but starting with the 1976 Viking lander, um, they adopted this concept of having stretch time. So rather than having extra minutes or extra hour, extra minutes added on to the end of the day and having everything get, get all wonky and crazy, they decided to just consider time stretched. So it's still a 24 hour day, but they call it a soul. Um, but it makes you have to think about time. So every differently. hour is longer yes. so that it there's still 24 of right. them, even though in earth time, it's 24 hours and whatever yeah. minutes. Exactly. Okay. Okay. I love so I think soul as well. It's very good. Soul, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but everything else stays the same. So hours, seconds, minutes are still the yeah. same, but the day is, okay. is a soul, um, which I think is great. I think that's fun. Um, but I think for a complication, it, it will be super helpful to have mm. Mars time time and earth time um, and perhaps multiple time zones on earth but generally in space Houston is used as, as time I'm assuming you're going from you know the the US but mm -hmm. um, I guess Russia will would use a different a different time zone but whoever's going you know whatever your home time is um, I would I would assume Houston for now also um, can I, yeah let me just say the one thing that I don't know um, I mean, you know, we always say we love mechanical watches because they are absolutely useless in this time and age because we, <laughs> we don't buy a mechanical watch because of the information we get from the watch, but because of the fascination that we get mm -hmm. from the a, a completely anachronistic way of measuring uh, such an important element like time. Um, but actually... <laughs> and now there's going to be a big switch if we're talking about mass because we will desperately need a timepiece when we go there 
And there won't be, I don't think there will be Wi-Fi available up there. <laughs> we, can, we can manage all the things that we can manage here. So we That's true. well need a watch, actually. That's true. I know yeah. some people are trying to work on Wi-Fi on Mars, but yes, uh, we definitely, I don't know, I would want to fly yeah. with a mechanical timepiece. Right. And and I think if you look, think really long term, you might actually need multiple time zones on Mars. Because if, you, manage, yep. if, you, if you think about it, you may not have settlements in the same location. So you might need a, a Mars GMT <laughs> with an Earth time with multiple time I think by zones. the time we're like living on different time zones on Mars, you're probably less concerned with all of the different Earth times. And, probably. You know, and, we probably. Would have, and we would have gone through the drama of who's going to get there first and say, this is my oh, yes. place, this is your yes. place. Right. How, is, yeah. how is that going to work, I wonder, actually? That's, uh, oh, there's a lot of thoughts. That could be a whole like separate show of like the oh, laws yeah. of, of Mars, which Martian are pretty Martian law, Martian law. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, which, is, which is pretty interesting. Um, a couple other complications that I haven't really heard talked about or seen much that I thought would be interesting and useful to have is some sort of adjustable signal delay. So you could have like a, a stopwatch or a, a timer that would tell you how quickly your message was going back to Earth. And then you could hit it again to have a, you know, at least a reasonable estimate of when a message was going to get back to you. But that would need to vary because it's not a set time. Um, it depends on oh, where wow. Mars is in relation to Earth's. And that can range anywhere from four minutes to 21 minutes, depending on how Earth and Mars are in relation to each other. This is, this is the current estimate. So it, it if yeah, we so we're going to send a message from Mars to right. or the information we are getting from Mars now, they travel it, at this exactly. Yeah. So if I'm on the surface of Mars and I'm yeah. saying, Hey Arthur, miss you, like yeah. if I click right. go, I know so how long it will The time in. is determined basically by the speed of light from or radio waves between here and there. Mm -hmm. But because yeah. the two planets move relative to each other, it changes from four to right. twenty one. Oh yeah. wow. I think um, it's around 10 minutes right now? Um, I want to say it was 13 minutes for okay. Perseverance. Um, that would be useful, a useful complication yeah. though. So like if you, if I spoke into the microphone and Pietro was on Mars, I, and I would expect it would take 13 minutes right. for my communication to get there. And then if you responded immediately, 13 minutes for it to come yeah. back. It's not, yet, it's not yet the, the time for live streams from Mars. <laughs> <laughs> not yet. <laughs> No, um, yeah, this wouldn't be possible. <laughs> but, you know, the way that spacecraft, they, they talk about it in terms of like spacecraft event time and Earth receive time. So it's when a spacecraft received a signal or is sending a signal is a spacecraft event time and then Earth received time. So that's just how you keep track of the communications. Um, and you heard some of the mission controllers talking a little bit about this in, in Perseverance mm -hmm. Landing. So I thought I, I would. I thought I would I'm learning. That. I'm learning here. Oh, it's, I, I mean, it's, this is just just highlights. Yeah, um, me too. Me too. Though. And then some other ones that we thought. I don't. I don't actually know enough to know if this would be something that's needed. But um, a pressure equalization valve of some sort, because presumably, if you're going from inside a you know habitat that's fully supportive of of life and different pressure to going outside on you know walks through mm -hmm. your Martian backyard, um, you may need yeah. some. It's accommodate for that. Yeah, and I was wondering about that because it depends upon what that pressure difference is and what the seals are like in the mm -hmm. watch, I guess, whether yeah. you need that. Uh -huh. um, yeah, it, yeah, the, yeah, 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 the, the, so the, an after sales center would be a tricky thing to set up as well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah, very true. For sure. Although uh, the studies, the studies with the um, depth of the oceans that we've been uh, conducting, you know, on, on, on most of, um, of uh, diving watches would be could, could could become Should be useful, useful in that yeah. situation. True. True. Yeah. Um, and then last one, I don't know if this is something that would need to accommodate for, mm -hmm. but um, gravity on Mars is a little bit different. It's about 38% of Earth's gravity. I don't know how much that affects the I, movements. I, I'm afraid I cheated on this. I called okay. Const Constantine Chaykin last yeah. night, and he, he answered <laughs> me from Russia. It was midnight oh for him. Wow. And he, you know, he, he answered me like, you know, uh, of course, gravity doesn't impact uh, the mechanical movement. So, okay, yes, it was my question was simply if the watch we may gonna talk about later would actually be functional on on Mars, and the mm -hmm. answer is absolutely yes. Great, uh, you know the thirty eight percent gravity. I'm a basketball player, and I find that very interesting in terms of that. <laughs> <laughs> You'd be able to dunk pretty yeah. easily. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> 
I don't think. Well, no, I, uh, jokes aside, I don't think there would be technically speaking, um, uh, yeah, an, an effect. Uh, Good. That, that, yeah. Well, you got it straight from the source, so yeah. that's. Um, I, although, although, yeah, now I'm thinking out loud, and you know, whoever is in the chat, if you want to correct me and call me call me an idiot, but uh, a tourbillon, a tourbillon complication could be quite tricky because, um, obviously. Mm -hmm. Tourbillon is a complication that was born to counterbalance the effect of gravity on the accuracy right. of the watch. Right. So right. in terms of accuracy, gravity may have, well, uh, you know, an impact. So, huh. right. yeah, big question mark. If you have me. to wind it more, yeah. Yeah, or, or a tourbillon just may be less useful because Even there's not useful. as much gravity to <laughs> yeah. affect the timekeeping. Yeah. I, I did see one, one comment in the chat that I thought was very interesting. I actually can't find it now to highlight. Someone was saying... On, if you're living on Mars, you might find use in a double moon phase because there are two oh, moons. Oh, that on would Mars. be fun. You can have Phobos <laughs> and Deimos. That would be that's, that's a so great good. one. I was going to say definitely. I don't need a moon phase in Ma on Mars. You know, talking about our moon, but yeah. is there are Mars's moon, and that's a different ballgame. That would be really yeah. fun to see. Yeah. yeah, maybe maybe Chaikin can do that in the in the next version, the Mark Four. Yeah, I also saw another comment about magnetic fields, which is a good one. Um, it's different on Mars, so that would be mm -hmm. interesting to know how much it would affect. Um, as someone who has magnetized many of my watches, like that, <laughs> would, uh, that would actually be be pretty good to know. Yeah, this, um, uh, Dan Dan has the exact current. Of delay. course he does. Thank you for correcting me, Dan. It was in thirteen minutes, eleven minutes, twenty two seconds. Yeah, thank you I for think. that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Well, let's move on to some some. Actually, yeah, we, we never did really a. We are sorry. We are, we are really brave to talk about these. This you know these. Yes. Yeah. So um, much to be learned. It's like never do math in public, right? Never right. do <laughs> engineering topics in public. Um, but maybe before we go on to some watches, we should do a wrist check. Um, oh right. I will go ahead and start. I'm wearing my um, NASA G-Shock. Um, mm. I don't have. I was debating between wearing my red Casio and the NASA G-Shock, but um, this was the spaciest watch I had, mm. so. Nice. Let me do that. And I'm wearing, it's not exactly as high tech as some of the watches we're going to look like, but it does have a ceramic case. This is my IWC Top Gun chronograph. Nice. One of my favorites. Nice. How about, how about you? Yeah, I have a Russian, Russian uh, watch, which is, let me do this. Um, we love... We love scouting and finding the, the talents of the future. So this is a 23 years old self-taught watchmaker who lives in Ingus Asia, which is a forgotten area, you know, of, of uh, rural Russia. And this gentleman is, a, I mean, this young, young, young boy really is so much in love with watches that he's, uh, yeah, he's developed his own timepiece recently, which is completely uh, handmade, awesome. except for the wow. movement is outsourced. And his name is Rashid uh, Tsoroev, and uh, he's on our website, and he's, nobody knows him. But uh, the moment we we launched it and we presented it to our collectors, we sold out all the all the wow. first uh, twenty pieces that he's making now as we speak. So uh, it's, it's, it's a good story. That's fantastic. I love it. I love hearing yeah. stories about kind of new up and comers. Yeah. I'll have to look him up. Yeah, that looks really cool. And, and and how cool that you know you found him and highlighted him, and that's probably going to be a big deal for his career yeah. too. That's awesome. Yeah, no, definitely. He's, he's very, um, and again, we come back to the endeavor of, there's a lot of entrepreneurship, risk taking, and, uh, you know, people like Elon, Elon Musk may, you know, set, set the, set the, um, the path in that respect. And this mm -hmm. guy is starting absolutely from nothing, you know, uh, financing every single screw, you know, of his watch <laughs> step by step. <laughs> And he's at a point where, yeah, he already has a demand when he's 23. So it's great. Know, 20 years, 30 years from now. It wow. Could be, it could be yeah. Like That's awesome. I, I, I love this comment. It's definitely a Scottish watches production because the wrist check came at 30 minutes. It's, a, it's on Mars time. <laughs> it's fresh out time. That's yeah, so it yeah, happened here. Yeah, oh, friend, said the same thing. friend yeah. says Martian uh, time, I guess. Yeah. Perfect. Uh, well, let's go ahead and go to the next slide. I'm kind of, um, this was a fun story that I that I came yeah. across. So um, while this was not an official JPL commission around the 2004 landing of the Mars rover, some engineers who worked at JPL um, found Which is the Jet Propulsion, Jet Propulsion Lab. Lab. Sorry, yeah. one of the NASA one of the NASA centers in Pasadena, California, um, uh, found 
uh, this guy Garo and asked for a watch that would run on on Martian time. So that extended that extended time. And I think what he did is really neat. These are not super expensive pieces, though. Now I really want to find one, particularly one with the, the gold Mars um, uh, dial. So the, the one that's the, the gold Mars dial, that's Martian time. And he slowed down an existing movement um, so that it it's it just operates on Mars time. And then the one on the left is a dual Earth Mars time. So I just think these are neat. They're still showing up on eBay. Um, he's still around making watches. I think it would be fun to to have one of these. That just wasn't a story I'd heard before. No, I think it's brilliant. The, I think, and you'll know uh, Stephanie very well, but the um, the equipment, the first uh, pioneers of you know um, space exploration had available in those days was absolutely primitive in so many ways. Um, that now when you go to a museum and you you kind of wonder how they could take such a risk, you know, equipped in the way they were, when we know that even the computers they had available were far less less powerful than a smartphone right. that we have now mm -hmm. available just to chat, you know, with our <laughs> mom and dad. Um, <laughs> this guy had a very, very neat and clean thought, you know, if the day is longer over there, we slow down the beating of the watch uh, to a lower frequency and we get the time the time of mass. So yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah respect. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And the fact that he was able, actually able to do it and uh, keep them at a reasonable price is mm -hmm. actually pretty impressive. Yeah. It's pretty neat. Yeah. Um, but cool. talking about kind of, you know, early technology, I was such a brat in my undergrad class, in my orbital mechanics class, we had figured out how to um, basically do all of our homework for us by running yeah. these MATLAB programs. And my professor was an astronaut. She flew on the shuttle. She was one of the ones who um, deployed the Hubble Space Telescope or was on the she Hubble. Fixed it. She fixed it. She yeah. was on the Hubble repair mission. Mm -hmm. And she, she, you know, we did all of our homework with MATLAB and she's like, you guys got to do it again. When I was on the space shuttle, we didn't have MATLAB. And I was like, all right, <laughs> fair point. Yeah. Fair enough. But there is, you know, like we said at the beginning, this, the watches in space has become a massive marketing platform. It's great. Yeah. But actually, watches before were, uh, you know, they had a functional meaning and they, and, and they were needed by cosmonauts to actually have one more tool. Um, mm -hmm. One of the things I, I respect about this uh, Russian brand we talked about before, Raketa, is that still to this day, they they collaborate with cosmonauts like Sergei Krikalev, who is today one of the most experienced Russian cosmonauts. And he developed one of the watches for them. And in terms of, you know, kind of leverage, but he wanted the watch to be 24 hours, for example. So you have this watch and it's 24 hour display. Why? Because of course, in space, you won't necessarily have an idea of the two cycles of 12 hours that we right. are used to. So he said, you know, if we are serious about developing a watch for, for, for the space, it has to be 24 hours because it's always mm -hmm. dark over there. So I have no idea whether right. it's in the morning or the afternoon and such. So I love this functional approach to develop watches that actually can be useful. And then obviously the marketing fascination and charm will comes comes later as a secondary right. thing, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Right. It'd be neat to have one on space station and tell you how many times you're gonna come up with sunrise. Right. You know, because you like definitely a, need 24 hours, but if you had like a secondary indication of like night day, night day, night isn't day. Isn't it like 90 mm. minutes? Or I think something. it's pretty fast, yeah. yeah. Um anyway, let's talk about some watches. Let's go to yeah, um absolutely. Yeah, so these are just a few examples I pulled of some some quick ones that I had found where brands had given attention, special attention to Mars. So the first one is Omega X33, um, but this particular one, they had worked with NASA and a few other space agencies to give some consideration to Mars. So I don't think there were mm -hmm. actually any major significant differences, like in terms of features, right? Or um, but I did want to I did want to highlight it. Um, the second it was, one was still yeah. in a place where you can just issue a watch and call it Mars watch. For, for, right. Yeah. yeah. You can just, whatever uh, reason. there's a red arrow. It's a Mars watch. Yeah. Um, <laughs> And then the second one I pulled up, um, this is Anacorn did a collaboration with actually NASA, I think. Um, and they include the NASA Worm logo, which I'm a big fan of. Actually, the designer of the NASA Worm logo, that mm -hmm. like old looking NASA, he just passed away this past week, which is oh, really, really sad. But oh, I'm yeah. glad NASA has brought back um, this, this logo. So this was one that was done leading up to the Perseverance landing. So it seemed, you know, like a recent, you know, 
issue yeah. one, which I, I, I yeah. think is, is pretty neat. And it, it does the dual time as well. Um, and then these last two are, you know, from Independence and PHR. I'd love for you to talk a little bit more about them. But I think yeah. these really kind of exemplify the the, the leading edge of, of brands that are thinking seriously about Mars watches, whether it's, um, you know, more the, the Louis Mornay, like, um, getting people excited about Mars and then the fun the functional one of the Constantine Chaikin. This, this is a watch you could actually wear on Mars. So yeah. these are brands that neither Arthur or I are super familiar with. I'd love, I'd love your opinion on both of these pieces. Yeah. As always the, um, the independent watchmakers, they have embraced the challenge of, uh, of getting into the nitty gritty of understanding what it means to develop a Mars watch rather than obviously waiting for the first cosmonaut to 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 step foot on Mars and then call the whatever watch is going to wear the Mars watch. So they want to get into the idea of how horology can help um, can, can help in integrating the systems that we have here on Earth with the new systems that will potentially be there when life on Mars will be something to be reckoned with. So the first approach from Louis Monet was kind of a um, more holistic in the sense that they decided uh, they decided to kind of inspire people to get interested in this race for Mars and integrate some parts of Mars on the dial of the watch. So the watch is actually has a little uh, aperture at three o'clock where you can uh, you can see fragments of Mars uh, soil basically. Uh, so there is it's it's more of a it's like a tribute uh, mm. to to Mars and a kind of an invite to. Uh, uh, to um, how can I say? Uh, uh, yeah, to be fascinated with uh, this new uh, uh, this new uh, mission that we all have as human humankind. Um, the thing with Louis Monet, Louis Monet is a classic brand. Louis Monet was the inventor of the chronograph. It was a it was a groundbreaking watchmaker in the 19th century. So why is the brand doing this these days? Is because Louis Monet's philosophy was always to move forward and to uh, break uh, conformities and to actually, you know, um, innovate and, and evolve. So uh, Louis Monet always has this drive to try to go beyond, far and beyond. However, you know, I love Louis Monet. Uh, I, don't, I don't think this, this watch doesn't necessarily dig into the horological um, mm. uh, timekeeping kind of adjustments that we are talking about and we would <laughs> want to... Uh, yeah, we will face when uh, life on two planets will be will be possible. Right. What's what's the function on the right there? I just see it says Mars. Is there a, f a function? Yeah. There? So that's the that's the aperture with the fragment of Martian soil. Ah, uh, uh, okay. Oh, that's yeah. that there. The dial yeah, is beautifully uh, decorated and is a handmade and it's a it's a exact depiction of a, of a part of the Martian soil as we see it on a Mars uh, map. Okay. Uh, but besides that, it's, this is a Metropolis timepiece by Louis Monet, which is the same as the core collection of Metropolis mm -hmm. that you will find in their, in their catalog. Uh, again, the fact, of course, that they have these uh, fragments of Mars soil um, is, is, is very special, of course, but it's like more of a, it's a tribute to Mars rather right. than a neurological endeavor, uh, as, as we said, into, you know, into timekeeping on Mars. Right. If that it's, makes sense. I hope yeah. it does. It does. Yeah. It's a good watch for now here on Earth to sort of connect with the romanticism of that exploration, right? Correct. I actually yeah. now I want to know exactly which scene this is on Mars. I was trying to think of like I'm going to go look up which mountain that is depicted <laughs> or, or whatever it is. Just to, um, but it is a, it's a beautiful piece. Um, yeah, there cool. is there yeah. is a moon watch same with the fragments of the moon, mm -hmm. and there is also Skylink. Uh, you can find it on the Louis Monet catalog or on the limited edition. Mm -hmm. The Skylink is um, in the same aperture at three o'clock, has uh, fragments of the space suit that was worn in a particular mission of uh, of uh, moon exploration, if you like. How so, fun. Oh, wow. That's great. There is, there is a series of, um, of uh, um, I can say, space, space pieces. Oh, very cool. I'm going to see if I can pull those up here while we're talking. NASA's really like clamped down on keeping um, artifacts in house, so it's hard to get. It's hard to get uh, pieces. Really? Um, really? Yeah, of, of historical missions now, but yeah, all the e easier from the Russians. <laughs> Sorry, it's a, it's a little easier to get materials from the Russians. 
Oh, is there? Yeah, you're right. Yeah. Yeah. So there's the space revolution ones, yeah. and let's see if we can find the moon one as well. Let's yes, see. it's down. It will find you at the bottom and the sky link as well. Okay. Yeah. There's the yeah, Mars. So yeah. You can see the sky link and, yeah, Mars. The sky link, yeah. yeah. Ah, yeah. Very cool. And the spacewalker, is there? Spacewalker is really, uh, it's really cool, but uh, once again, no, there is no direct, um, hmm. uh, direct link. Uh, with uh, you know a technical feature that regards mm -hmm. the exploration of space, right? Um, but they all they all uh, yeah tributes and reminiscent. Hmm. They're beautiful. They are beautiful. Yeah, very yeah, cool. yeah, very very much so, very much so. Well, let's talk next about the the Constantine check-in because that, that really just um, yes. is an incredible piece, and I don't know enough about it. So um let me pull up a good tell me a little bit about the the movements that that he's put in here the dual time um yes constantine yeah. uh, uh took the whole the whole thing to the next level <laughs> no kidding and um he was constantine constantine is a self-thought watchmaker he's considered to be a genius because he can do on his own without being educated specifically in the field of watchmaking he can master the the, the most com complicated sophistications in horology. Uh, so he took he embraced the challenge three years ago, which is for him is a very long time. But he, you know, in terms of Swiss watchmaking, three years is absolutely nothing. You know, there are brands that take five or six years just to develop their own in-house manufacturer caliber, if you like. But in three right. years, he's worked through an incredibly complicated uh, mass conqueror uh, Mark One. There was his first, his first concept piece that besides dual time indication, it was also incorporating all sorts of uh, other complications that were relative to the difference between timekeeping on Mars and timekeeping on, uh, on the Earth. That concept watch um, um, proved to be too, uh, too, too far, you know, too far... Uh, to, to be understood, if you like. So he <laughs> he worked uh, he worked on a second version that again stopped at the at the at the phase of the design, and he never produced not even as a prototype. To then develop this third version that is called Mars Conqueror Mark III, that in his mind, besides the two previous versions, that in his in his idea were just there to um, to to develop exactly what he he would have wanted for a watch that could finally travel to Mars. And in his mind, this Mark III that you see here is that watch. Why? Because rather than um, slowing down the pace of the uh, Earth-like you know, mechanical movement, he decided to incorporate two movements, one that is measuring time on the Earth and the other one is measuring time on Mars, which is something that has, had not been, been done before. That is very easy to say, but fairly tricky to uh, to put together. <laughs> yeah. Especially when you also add your traveling time in the middle as well. So here you have three times indication. So you have your UTC time indication as the Greenwich, you know, the Greenwich uh, mean time indication. Your home time, you know, for example, of course, you are based in Washington DC, so you could decide to have your home time as well there. Mm -hmm. But the UTC is always useful, especially if you're an engineer, you know, a cosmonaut traveling to, to Mars. You have your Greenwich Mean Time, your home time, and your Mars time as well, which is indicated at 6, 6 o'clock. So it's a bit of a piece of uh, genius from, uh, from Constantine that has gone once again, like it happens all the time with independence. It's gone under the radar until when, you know, one of the big brands in two years, they'll come up with a great idea of a, of a mass GMT and the world will be absolutely <laughs> astonished. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What's what's the red indicator by the, by nine, nine o'clock there. Okay. So the two, so the, the reason why the case has this spacecraft like um, shape is as always with Constantine, not just an aesthetical uh, feature, but you see the two crowns, the two crowns is a patented system of two crowns. Yes, one at eight o'clock, one at four o'clock. Those are actually functioning. The left crown uh, basically is the mode set. And every oh. time you turn it, the color at nine o'clock will change because it will tell you now you are on manual winding mode. Now you are mm. on uh, UTC 
correction mode and now you are on MTC mass uh, mass uh, time uh, correction mode and the crown at four o'clock will operate those adjustments oh, when, wow, wow. Yeah, when the mode is set correctly that's amazing that is really cool at first you know you had mentioned it had essentially two movements and i thought it was one per movement but that's actually even more ingenious and integrated to have it be this mode selector and then the sort of the setting function or or interaction yeah. on the other yeah. one yeah, no, it's all oh. it's all connected with two movements. Uh, yeah, I didn't mean that it was the the sum of two movements, mm -hmm. but it was like right. there. It's actually three three indications uh, all together. Right. So the the incredible thing about Constantine is that you know you if you travel to Moscow and you visit his uh, man, manufacturing place, which is an incredible place to visit, and um, and then uh, you know you can visit the Raketa as well, uh, uh, headquarters in Saint Petersburg. You can really leave the uh, untold story of both Russian exploration of space and um, and mechanical, you know, watchmaking development that was relative to that, which is again a very untold story. Because if you type it anywhere on Google, you'd find very very little. It's very true. I know so little about Russian brands, and now I just want to delve into it, um, particularly given all the space history. I um yeah. the dad moscow on our trip of our, like <laughs> list of watch trips to take that's right um oh and there's the case oh, there's back. A back. very nice okay. yeah. that's neat i hadn't seen that before wow so clever i mean just just beyond creative i have a hard enough time setting my g-shock like <laughs> this this is actually a very like um good elegant uh elegant yeah system, this so. is if you like you know and i'm not one to say you know, having been the first doesn't make you the best if what you propose is not, you know, is not up to the game that you want to play. Uh, but in this case, we're talking about the first intergalactic timekeeper because it is actually, you know, to, to my knowledge, the first uh, mechanical timepiece that masters uh, those informations at mm -hmm. the same time. And uh, if you were going to go to Mars tomorrow, you could put on your wrist and you'll have your mass time and, and, and earth earth time, you know, correctly indicated on your wrist. And it looks very cool as well, by the way. It does. It does look neat. <laughs> you know, I'll have to talk to some, um, some folks that I know. I, I'm sure this is like so far down on the list of things that people are thinking about in terms of actually going to Mars, but I'm glad mm -hmm. someone is, right? There's, yeah. there's at least one guy who is. Um, but I wonder how, how you keep track of, of time, while you're on your way to Mars, right? Oh, do, you just, do you just keep going on Earth time until you land on Mars? How do you keep track of the constant? I guess it depends on who you're talking to, yeah. right? If you're if you're if there's no one on Mars and you're headed there, you're probably talking to people on just Earth. On Earth. And, yeah, yeah, at least for the early missions. <laughs> I think it, uh, and it's gonna be a little bit like you know when you travel from uh, uh, you you travel the the wrong way round the Earth, you know, to move, let's say from from Europe, you'll fly to Japan, and then from Japan to go to America, obviously, you mm -hmm. go the, go wrong, the wrong way around for yeah. us Europeans <laughs> to, to America, and you completely, unless you you have some kind of instruments helping you, there's no way you're going to keep track of what, it's true. what's happening. So I, it's the thing is that it will last much longer, I guess. <laughs> the yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Though my rule when I get on an airplane is I always set my watch to the place I'm gonna be landing as soon as I as soon as I board. So ah, I wonder okay. if, um, so maybe you would do differently. Maybe I would do well, differently. this watch should have both already ready. So. Yeah, I think Stephanie, you're suggesting a next complication, which which should be the universe time zone. Uh, there we go. Complication whereby, <laughs> yeah. depending on the planet you're aiming for, then or the zone between Mars and here, there should be different time zones. In a U way. Universal yeah. time, like true. yeah, yeah. Universal yeah. Time. yeah. <laughs> Can we patent it today. I think so. I think so. There's an opportunity there. So well, it would be. Would it be universe or solar system? Maybe solar system. I think we can limit it to the solar okay. system. That's, All right. We'll, that's we'll deal reasonable. with that. Then. Well, Peach, are there other are there other Mars pieces we haven't thought about, or or ones that you've that you've come across? So in um, no, I I yeah, honestly, I'm stuck on this Mars conqueror because uh, uh, yeah, somebody's is. Uh, GMT Galaxy Time. Galaxy yeah. Meme Time. I love it. <laughs> very good. Very good. Very good. Uh, no, I was blown away by this Mars Conqueror. And for your information, we, 
this was an eight pieces limited edition. So mm -hmm. it's only for wow. the very few that will make it first, but they are all pre-sold. We managed to get two of them. Wow. And funny enough, we sold one, but one is technically still available. And um, I'm just hoping that I can be successful enough from now to June when this will be will be delivered to maybe keep one for myself. <laughs> I, don't know. I don't know if that will happen. I'm, I'm too good at sharing. Um, no, there is, there is another crazy watch, again, from uh, Raketa, the Russian watchmaker. You know, of course, as I discovered it, you know, I'm not an expert and I'm not a watchmaker, so I just discover things as I go along. Um, basically, all the all the planets in the solar system they they actually they actually revolve uh, anti-clockwise uh, um, uh, uh, on themselves and around the sun. I think there are two exceptions. I think Uranus and Venus that they actually turn on themselves yeah, okay. clockwise. But actually, Raketa uh, made a great point of saying, we don't, you know, why would we set all our watches to, to actually go clockwise when the entire solar <laughs> system, as a, as, a, as, a, as a fact of nature, actually works anti-clockwise? The other way, yeah. So there is a, a watch called Russian Time that actually uh, shows the time counterclockwise. So you read the time the other way around, which, which is totally confusing for us. But then if you think about it, our way of telling time, it must be equally confusing to any child that initially starts to try to understand what's going on on a watch because it right. doesn't make any sense with nature. It doesn't make any sense in general. Right. It's just what we get used to it. Clockwise is the way we do it, right? But if, if you introduce someone to it the other direction from the start, there'd be no difference yeah. to them, right? And, oh, and uh, Arthur is a bit like, oh, sorry, sorry, Stephanie. No, that's just a really neat piece. I'd never heard of that. That yeah. that's yeah. It's, it's also on the website. You'll find it, and it's a yeah. bit like uh, you know Arthur with Jimi Hendrix. You know, uh, <laughs> <stopping his> guitar <laughs> the whole way around and just getting on with it. You know. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Amazing. That's awesome. Yeah. Very cool. Well, I guess let's say we've gone about fifty minutes. Maybe yeah. we could see if there's any questions for Pietro in the chat as well. I saw one or two. Um, if you asked them before and we missed them, you feel free to ask them again. Yeah, I'll, any I'll any about Mars stuff or independent brands, these particular pieces. Um, Pietro, you're a wealth of knowledge of, of stuff we we have no idea about. Well, so no, no, this has been really fun. Have a look at the comments in the next weeks. So you'll find, you know, I'm sure <laughs> half of the things we discuss will be corrected in so many ways. But I, I'm fascinated. I think um, I, I have the curiosity that in, independent watchmakers show every day of their life in what they do. Sometimes they are they do they work anachronistically on uh, on uh, on uh, on researches that are just for the sake of unlocking certain mm. parts knowledge that we haven't managed to unlock yet and i find that so romantic and fascinating so i'm i, I love learning about it yeah we, we do have a request for you to show your watch again and let's see um, and maybe, and yeah, maybe i can make you uh and tell us a little bit more here. about it too let's see if we can uh okay. make your screen larger do, so it's a bit better like this probably yeah no, it's better so it's a very neat very pure design uh by uh rashid Sorov. And as you can see, the, um, the dial itself, the hands and the indices are all hand manufactured by, by Rashid. Whereas the movement, which is a high grade ETA, uh, it's, it's, it's lovely, it looks lovely, but it's mm -hmm. obviously outsourced. And the case as well is outsourced and then just finished by uh, Rashid. But uh, this doesn't take anything away from the piece because the watch is actually priced 1,500 uh, US dollars, which for what it is, is, is probably the, the, the cost of the movement itself. Yeah. Right. To have anything made by hand in a, in a watch of that price is really unique and striking. I love the dial. It's great. Yeah, it's pure. And this is the first prototype that I kept for myself as now Rashid is completing his first uh, production. Uh, you find the story of Rashid on the Watch Press. So the Watch Press is uh, one of my favorite blogs, um, and uh, on the limited edition as well. If you're interested, uh, Ben. Great. We can. Uh, we'll after the fact. We'll add some links to that in the description for the video too, yeah. so people can find out more. That sounds yeah. great. Let's see. Um, Koos, our friend Koos, is actually saying it, that movement looks a little bit similar to some of the the ones that Panerai used before they went in house. Is that is that correct to your knowledge? Do you know? 
I wouldn't. I wouldn't know. I wouldn't know. And I. Um, no, I wouldn't know. Uh, I was thinking. No, I'm gonna say something uh, not accurate. Uh, I I wouldn't know that. But on the on the watch press, you find the exact code of the ETA, of mm. the ETA movement. And um, I want to say the U2392, but I may be I may be mistaken here. Uh, but uh, Pandora, it's interesting because I was at Richmond when they started to develop their own caliber, and that was a uh, that was an adventure. And again, they they took six years to develop that. So. Wow, and I was mentioning yeah. Jake in, in three years basically developed the Mars watch, it's, it's, it's quite amazing. Yep, yeah, very cool. Let's... You know, one thing that'll be interesting to see is how brands take on marketing of, of future space things, Mars in particular. Will there be more interest in this? And you know, I think there's some, some comments here about you know, first Omega on Mars. Um, and I wonder if there will be this fight about the first one or, <laughs> you know, something unique about it, um, well, or well, trying yeah. to clamor for marketing opportunities. Yeah. And it, it all depends on who goes first, right? Whether it's, um, Absolutely. and it was good at or NASA or both. Story. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. yeah. But you, Stephanie have a, a great point. I think uh, as an engineer, you're interested in the why, I guess. And, uh, mm -hmm. um, I, tend to be on the same side. Yeah, it's good enough to say, yeah, that's the moon watch. But why was it so important to have that watch and not mm -hmm. another one? Uh, and uh, of course, that question can't quite be answered in terms of the moon exploration. So Mars, maybe things are looking a bit different because A, it's such an incredible uh, accomplishment, will be an uh, incredible accomplishment when it finally happens. And second, I really love the idea of will we need watches, uh, you know, to accomplish that. And in that case, can watches really help because of their functionality rather than mm -hmm. for just for their aesthetics? So yeah, I'm I'm wondering uh, honestly. I, I yeah, don't know it'll it'll be interesting to see if the space agencies commission something right for with with specific needs, and that's how you know a lot of how we got got the the fame of the Speedmaster, or will it just be you know, they don't need a watch mm. and some astronaut will bring his, you know, his mm. or her personal. But even the Speedmaster was finding something commercially produced off the shelf that right, met the requirements. Right? Yeah. Or, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it, it is true that if I was one of the commissioners of these big explorations, I I would want to go to a genius like Constantine mm -hmm. to understand his thinking because he to get where he's got where he's got it's because he has an understanding of how time works mm -hmm. that goes beyond the normal the normal understanding that we all have, we all have as me surely as a common mortal if you like but uh, because they must have minds that think quite likewise in a way so uh, yeah i would easily imagine a, a meeting between you know people of that caliber uh, understanding and try to unlock the because it's still a big mystery the understanding of this fourth dimension which is time that is still the thing that we can't quite um understand as humans i don't i don't know if you agree i don't know no i do yeah. i would just love to run that procurement for nasa how fun would that be <laughs> to be in charge of going yeah. and having to figure that have out have someone with the actual passion right. for it too right I, I saw a great comment in here if someone had suggested something similar to um a jlc reverso where you have mars on mars time on one time and earth time mm. on the other side there i think go. that's um yeah because i think that's a great idea um that that's a fun way of, of displaying it in terms of yeah, in terms of the uh, showcasing the time, yes. But in terms of mm -hmm. how you get to develop the information, yeah, it, you know, that's the real work that needs to be done. And also, you right. may argue that maybe I don't know how they will be equipped on Mars, but it may be a bit difficult to be with the with gloves. Your gloves. Yeah, yeah. Uh, oh, but true. I love yeah. the idea. I love the idea yeah. for sure. For sure. <laughs> I think we'll 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 have to learn <laughs> a lot. <laughs> I I see another question here for you. Um, from Nitin saying, hey, I guess, is there a, are there plans for a Mark IV of the Chaikin Mars watch? Do you know? I, I, just, I wasn't aware. It is possible, but it's like, um, so investing, uh, investing is a big word because I always <laughs> say, um, uh, I, I'm not, how can I say, um, uh, I'm not naive. I know that when you spend a lot of money on a, on a timepiece, Everyone would feel stupid if if the timepiece was going to lose value or was not worth what has been invested. 
But in this case, we are talking about a potential history maker, if you like. So if it was me, I would definitely want the Mark III. I would want even the Mark I that will never be in commerce and it will be in a museum, right. uh, basically. And on the Mark IV, we'll see what happens, but the Mark III will always be the first and it's right. been produced in eight pieces only. So the, the risk is basically nil. You know, in, yeah. Yeah. In, in respect of having that piece in your collection. Right. This is, a, this is another interesting one from uh, our friend mm. Ben from Fratello. Um, how does it wear, having seen it in person and, and handled it? So I've seen um, the prototype when I went to, uh, to Russia, right before, actually it was when the pandemic started. It was February 2009, uh, 2020. Uh, no, if, if, I mean, I have, a, I have a wrist that accommodates pretty much any, any watch, I have to be honest. So if you have a very small wrist, it would not it would not wear great. I you know I have to be honest. Um, but again, I don't think wearability is 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 the one thing I would care about. Like right. when you go, if you're going on Mars and you're wearing one of those big suits, <laughs> you know, asking yourself, oh, this doesn't fit me quite right. I look chunky. Right. So <laughs> it becomes secondary in a way to me, but I understand, again, if I have to answer the question, if you have a very small wrist, it would not quite uh, quite give justice to your to your wrist in a way. Yeah. Uh, I'm checking now, I should know this, but I'm checking now because it's a funny, it's a funny uh, case size. The case is actually um, uh, 55 by 48 and it's 15, it's 15 thick uh, millimeters of okay. course. But yeah. we wear a bit like a Panerai bronze if you want yeah okay yeah. yeah right it's actually more reasonable than i thought i thought it i thought it looked bigger so that's yeah that's yeah, cool yeah. Gonna, um, so i have nothing to do with sjx but i enjoy reading you mm -hmm. know uh, i think they're brilliant if you go on their website you'll find some wrist shots as well oh yes actually i think i have that pulled up if we can uh, and, and they had some i think they had some pictures of the of the mark one as well that, um yes see. yes yes um, here, SJX, here, yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's the Mark One, mm -hmm. and it tells you there is nine complications in the Mark One. Uh, ah, yeah. At the same time on the on the watch, and then basically the Mars Conqueror is a simplified version of the Mark One that mm -hmm. Constantine thought the Mark One was too much and too far. Oh wow! Yeah, I do see a lot of different indications there. That's very cool. Oh, that there's a wrist shot. Yeah, that. it was never produced, and that's the wrist shot. Yeah. So saying that it's 53 because of the two crowns that come out, you know, on either side, 53 sounds like unwearable. But then when you see it, it's obviously because of the two crowns at the bottom. Right, mm -hmm. right. It's a very unique shape, right? So the regular dimensions don't really do it justice, I guess. <laughs> very cool. Yeah. Very cool. Let's see if there's any any last questions here. Actually, this is an interesting one. Mark Wheeler is asking, has anyone seen the Fortis Cosmonaut? I'm on the 18. It references more. I don't know I don't that know. watch. Mm -hmm. I, I haven't heard of that. I uh, I only know that so forties with uh, Bulova, Oyer, um, Seiko, uh, Stormansky, Pobeda. They are all watches credited for at one point having made something first in regards to the exploration of space and watches, basically. Uh, right. But no, I'm not familiar with the exact story about the 40s. No, I'm not. I'm not either. And 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 one more on a on a personal note from our friend Coos. Uh, what's your latest purchase, Pietro? And uh, the North Face, North Face. I don't know. Um, okay, so latest purchase is it's this uh, the one I'm wearing. And also the very last is the big zero by Raketa, which I, I got nice. last, last week. So I'm uh, obviously I'm lucky because we represent over 30 brands and some of them we, we officially distribute. So uh, most watches I have to let go, but sometimes I manage to, to nail one or two. Nice. Uh, but I have big ideas for the future because, you know, as a, an entrepreneur, when all, all the finances go into pushing the, the business rather than building a, a massive collection. So I'm not, I'm not a collector yet, uh, unfortunately. So I want to deserve to be as soon as possible. <laughs> all in good time. Yeah. Well, 
Thank you so much for yeah, joining us today. Yeah, thank you so much. This was great. This was a really fun one for us. And um, we really appreciate your knowledge of, of these independents and going so far into the, the Mark III um, in particular. It was just really, really fun. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. I think, um, I mean, credit to you because this may be remembered as the first, you know, as the first <laughs> podcast to tackle <laughs> the unknown, you know. Yeah. The, the watchmaking race to Mars, uh, which is still in in the big in in yeah in in, in it's still happening. I mean, it hasn't happened yet. So uh, maybe we should think about one on Clubhouse as well. I I can see yeah, yeah for sure. Coming in and uh, giving their point of view. Yeah, I'd love some stuff. more thoughts and opinions, and that would, yeah, that would and be great. Clubhouse has been. Uh, we've just tried a couple chats on there recently, but that'd be fun to get yeah. together on there. Yeah, be good, cool. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for having me. I really enjoyed it. It was really fun, as you say. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much. And thanks, everyone, for joining us and commenting and participating. I make fun. sure to check out Limited Edition yep. and, of course, everything else Scottish Watches. Mm -hmm. And uh, we'll uh, we'll be back next week with some to-be-determined yes, topic. We'll exactly. figure it out <laughs> <laughs> before then. But thanks again, Pietro, and thanks, everybody, thank for joining. Thanks. thanks. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye.